Obviously, I'll be doing this from kind of my point of view as an audience editor for a um, publication. Um, but I'm hoping that interspersed with that, you can kind of use that um, use any tips and tricks that I give kind of individually. Um, there's definitely things interspersed in this that I've learned from being a reporter, um, from being content editor, from being a video journalist. Um, and some of the things that I tell you, you might find quite basic. You might kind of think, oh, I already knew that. So boring. Um, but there also might be things that, you know, you've not heard before. And that's definitely the case when I've done kind of social media training for uh, journalists in my newsroom. Um, I had one uh, editor who didn't come to my last social media training and I kind of went over to his desk and was like, oh, this is just starting. Are you coming in? And he said, um, oh, no, no, I know. I know how to do social media. And I was like, mm, OK, but you could just come along and, and learn a little bit, maybe. And he was like, no, 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 I don't need to, don't need to. And I was like, I think you definitely should um, with a, a couple of smaller choice words. Um, so he, he came in, he attended and he he left. And as he was leaving, he said, I learned quite a lot, actually. I didn't know as much as I thought. So there you go. There's always room to learn. And no matter how much you're kind of embedded on social media, um, there are always people that you can kind of learn from and learn more from and definitely kind of from experiences and stuff so hopefully that's what you get from today um so what will be, co be covered in today's session also for all the gen z i'm very sorry i'm very painfully millennial so there will be gifts in this that you will properly cringe at um starting off with the simpsons ones i thought i'd, I'd jump straight in there there is some harry potter later just got to deal with it because I'm a millennial at heart, so there you go. So yeah, so I'll just touch on what I do as audience editor. Um, and then looking at Twitter, uh, we'll look at kind of how to post yourself and promote your journalism, um, your tweets, um, what to tweet, how to tweet, that sort of thing. Uh, then we'll take a look at news gathering, uh, which <clears throat> when I first started as a reporter, um, social media was kind of only really just taking off for journalists and how they used it. Um, and it's kind of how I fell into working in social media is being kind of one of the youngest in the newsroom when it started and a lot of kind of older and wiser journalists saying, what is this weird thing? Um, and I kind of had to learn along the way and then ended up teaching people along the way as well. So um, there's definitely tools that you can kind of use. Um, so we'll kind of cover those. Um, then touching on verification um, and UGC, so user generated content. Again, these sort of things like Twitter and all social media platforms have been around for so long that often these things can kind of get overlooked now that it's that it's so kind of ingrained, but these things are still really important um, in kind of sourcing journalism um, and backing things up for articles and videos and things like that. Um, and then also finally looking at safety. Um, I wasn't really sure how to like title the last bit, um, but I feel like safety kind of encompasses everything and it's it's how to kind of stay safe as a journalist, just in general terms of, of the safety, but also to look after yourself and your kind of digital well-being, um, as it's often known as. Uh, and I'm the first to encourage my team to, when they have a day off, don't go on Slack, don't go on your phone, have some time away. Um, and I also have worked with journalists in the past who have been trolled, um, who have um, received abuse online. Um, and I think there's definite things that maybe um, hopefully that you can learn from me talking about those experiences. Um, I'll go through the slides um, there'll be things along the way. A lot of the time there'll, there will be notes on screen and a lot of the time I'll be talking alongside things. If there's something you want me to go back on, um, just let me know and I'm happy to then take questions at the end. Uh, so what I do in my job, um, so as Ian said, I'm the audience editor. Um, I started my time at I and um, the I paper as their social media editor, um, all on my Todd, doing it all by myself after coming from a team of uh, about seven of us at Metro, um, which was quite a shock to the system. Uh, but now uh, since joining, I was then promoted to audience editor and our audience team as a whole has grown, which has been amazing. We kind of just started off um, as Kind of five heads of department uh, so that was social uh, video seo newsletters and our homepage and app um, and that was kind of basically because we were it was mainly the newspaper and we were kind of like the digi team um, we're now an audience team completely kind of as 
alongside the, the newsroom, which is now hybrid between the newspaper and online. We all work as one now, um, which is really nice. And uh, the audience team has now grown into departments. So it's not just one very quite stressed person um, doing a million things for that one particular section. Uh, we now have deputy editors and uh, our audience executives as well and assistant audience editors. Um, and really it's been it's been really interesting to kind of grow that department um, and we've currently just been hiring a, another audience executive um, which in kind of other terms is like a junior journalist role but very much focused on these areas of audience so they're a journalist but they're an audience and digital focused journalist um, and it's it's been really fun actually uh, we hired two last year and being able to teach these these junior journalists and turn them into kind of now reporters stroke video editors stroke um, newsletter producers um, and that's kind of what we're, we're doing going forwards. Um, so I, in my role now, as well as managing that team, um, I analyze our audience data, um, support the kind of content production across the website, working closely with our head of digital, um, and then yeah, provide audience insight to our journalists in the newsroom. So telling them how their stories are doing, what audiences they're reaching, um, and so forth. Uh, I also really like cats, so there are a lot of cats in this presentation. Um, so let's start off with posting. So why Twitter? Um, so yeah, so 77% of journalists um, value Twitter above all other social platforms, um, which is according to Muckrack State Journalism Report from this year. Um, and yeah, it's it's really it's really highly valued among journalists. Um, and the reason behind this is because a lot of journalists are on there. A lot of journalists use it to see other journalists, what they're doing. Um, as a company, they have been probably the most receptive um, to journalists and newsrooms in what they want and need and actually changing to adapt to that. Also in producing products specifically for journalists and newsrooms um, and specifically products that work and you see immediate results on, um, not just kind of built to maybe seem like they're doing something for journalists, uh, which I won't name the platform that has done that in the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, so Twitter really do build close relationships with newsrooms. Um, they trial products with specific um, newsrooms and teams. Um, so you may see that some um, news publications feature slightly more than others on your feed in specific areas on Twitter. Um, that's because Twitter has built kind of close relationships with them and they're trialing them out. Um, that can be frustrating for other newsrooms to kind of them to own that space, but also being part of those innovating teams within newsrooms is also really cool. Um, and then it's kind of on you as another newsroom to kind of catch up and, and be as good and be there to be like, well, we want to be on the next one. Um, so yeah, it's definitely been the most receptive. It's also just actively very good at for news gathering um, and as well as kind of promotion. So it's kind of pre-news and then post-news. Um, you can use it in various forms. Um, I know I definitely did when I was a reporter um, and then now I basically spend every day telling everyone in our newsroom to share their stories um, and just to kind of give them that extra bit of boost and traffic for us. Um, but there is kind of a downside to it. As, uh, I would say a large question hanging over journalists' slightly obsessive use of Twitter is, is it as popular among our readers as well as journalists? Um, there is definitely a slight feeling at times of being in a bit of a bubble. Um, and are you actually reaching those people that are going to be commenting on things like your Facebook posts or that stumble across your TikTok on the latest kind of breaking news? Um, the answer is no and yes. Um, so I would say the audience isn't necessarily as broad as you can find on other platforms, um, but it can be very, very engaged. So people that follow you on Twitter as a news organisation or as a single journalist, they will be very, very engaged with your content. For example, um, we're kind of at, at the eye, we're very proud of our politics coverage. Uh, we're straight down the middle, very ba balanced reporting. 
Um, and we find that a lot of our readers are those kind of really politics nerds. They, they're really into it. And so they're not, they're less likely to reply to a tweet with Boris is a dickhead than actually, well, I'll find in 2009, Boris wrote this article and they'll come at you with like a slightly higher reference point <laughs> than just abuse, um, which was very nice when I first started, very different to previous publications I've worked at. Um, but it does, and it does mean that there is then the potential that to grow your audience and get more people engaged with you. And people generally, in terms of people that um, consume the news, uh, prefer to see other people delivering it rather than a faceless account, um, which is why I very much push for our journalists to <clears throat> share their own stories and create their own kind of readership. Um, alongside what we produce from the main accounts with our social media team. Um, and yes, the glory days are now gone. You can't just start a Twitter account and suddenly have 24,000 followers within a week. Um, you will probably have noticed if you've been on Twitter as long as I have, um, that all those offshoot accounts that were kind of created about seven or eight years ago. Um, so it'd be like Telegraph style, Telegraph. Um, I think they have like, a, a, like different like women's football, women's netball, lo loads of the, not specifically the Telegraph, but loads of other places that had kind of each of their sections within the newspaper had a specific Twitter account. They've all either gone quiet or been absorbed into the main account um, just because those accounts were very um, good and easily to grow kind of a few years ago. And now that's kind of died off and it is quite hard to um, see that kind of accelerated growth now on Twitter. Um, and most companies now are working towards increasing engagement um, and still increasing growth in terms of followers, um, but not as rapidly as we used to see, um, mainly because there's probably not as many new users on Twitter anymore. Um, and so, yeah, it's all about kind of that quality engagement and having those return and kind of loyal followers coming back to you and reading your stuff. So looking at what you can do, so your profile. Um, this is obviously where you start with Twitter. It's where people will find you specifically. And the first thing they'll look at when they see an article that like a tweet that's maybe gone viral, they're like, well, who shared this? Um, and I would say it should reflect you, not just as a journalist, but as a person. Um, there's a reason why people will click on an account that's got a picture that's not got the like Twitter egg, just kind of floating there in space. Um, they want to get to know you a little bit. Um, I would say do as much as you want, but like don't go over the top, don't give too much, you don't have to sell your soul um, and just be as professional as you would kind of in a newsroom. Um, there's now a feature where you can uh, switch to a professional profile um, and this means you can flag that you're a journalist. Um, I believe this is potentially only um, available to people that are verified, so I would say try and get verified. Um, this now, this used to be uh, people like myself um, who would contact Twitter and say, hi, can I verify some of my journalists, please? Uh, and they go, hmm, I don't know in six weeks. And then we'd maybe submit six and like two of them would get it. And we just really didn't know why. Um, there's now a self kind of verification process that you can go through. Um, and I've just kind of summarized that on there now. Um, so I don't know if you want to kind of take a note of that, but it is within your settings and your privacy. Um, you go to your account, account information, uh, enter your password, um, and then you request verification. Um, you can then go to select an author page if you've got one that's kind of on a, a website or somewhere that you've published on. If you have an online portfolio, you can submit that. Often they'll ask for article links. Um, they used to ask for uh, examples of your journalism going viral, uh, which I don't think is a requirement anymore. But if you do have a piece that's kind of gone mad for you on Twitter, um, then include that there too. Um, and being verified kind of hasn't lost as lost that much oomph, but I would say there are a lot of verified people on Twitter. Um, but it is good when you are kind of sourcing news to just have that kind of backup there that people know that you are a real person um, and that they can kind of trust you um, as a journalist um, in that professional capacity. 
Um, so a couple of examples here, we've got Molly, who's our brilliant uh, world correspondent, uh, world current affairs correspondent at the Eye. Um, and she spent three weeks on a migrant rescue ship in the Mediterranean. Um, and she amazingly documented that through video. Um, she also tweeted the entire time uh, while also writing all her stories um, and filming herself rescuing children <laughs> as well. So um, she did a lot, but she kept it kind of professional, but you were still seeing it through her eyes. Um, and that's kind of what I mean by sharing you as a person and as a journalist. Um, and just kind of that keeping that realness there like people want to feel like they know you as much as somebody who watches Good Morning Britain every day feels like they know Susanna Reid um, it's it's that same kind of thing like the professional you and just giving like just that little bit more than just sharing your article links twice a day um, Chris Ship um, did some incredible he's a royal correspondent at ITV did some amazing coverage in the last uh, 10 days or so um, this was his sign off after the funeral that he was going to go lie in a dark room, which who can blame him? He probably hadn't slept <laughs> for many hours in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then another good example here, Lewis Goodall obviously um, did really well uh, at the BBC. Yes, BBC Newsnight, sorry, and Sky News. Um, and just a good example there of a really nice bio that's like says who he is, says what he does. He's tagged in all the places he currently works, used to work um and just making it very clear who he is what he does um and again just looking reliable um and like someone you could trust and want to kind of receive news from your tweets um so if you wouldn't shout it across a newsroom don't tweet it uh this was from one of my uni lecturers uh in 2011 um and it was potentially a dig at me at the time I was going through a breakup and I was tweeting about it and uh, I mean potentially she got up one of my tweets and put it on the screen in the lecture hall uh, and basically was like don't tweet about this uh, because people will find it and they're going to be wanting to hire you and it's going to be on your Twitter history it's not there anymore so don't go look for it um, <laughs> but yeah so I've always kind of stood by this and said this to colleagues so um, yeah, if you wouldn't shout it across the newsroom, don't tweet it. That kind of also fits into a, obviously that depends around your personality. There's plenty of people who I've heard shout certain things in newsrooms that they maybe actually wouldn't put that on Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of a, a goodish rule to stand by. Um, also reflects how populated by journalists Twitter is. Um, it's kind of one giant newsroom. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd kind of follow that. And I always try to, um, like, if you wouldn't mind your boss walking up to you and quoting it back to you, then, you know, just go for it, tweet it out there. Um, so ways that you can tweet. So tweet your stories, tweet your colleagues' stories, tweet your friends' stories, um, and tweet things that, you, that interest you. If there's a really interesting piece that you've read that's from a rival publication, you can still tweet that, that's fine. Uh, unless your editor's going to shout at you, then apologies if that happens. Um, using media with your, in your tweets almost certainly always leads to higher engagement. So by media, uh, pictures, video, GIFs, um, they'll always tend to be slightly more appealing in feeds. Um, if you think about the things that you like and retweet, most of the time, I can guarantee, even if they're just memes, they're going to be images or videos. Um, and that means that kind of when you're sharing those, sorry, excuse me, um, they're going to get more people involved in them. Um, as mentioned, recruiters will look at your Twitter profile. It's kind of a, the unofficial, um, your front page and portfolio for you as a journalist, I would say, um, in hiring people in the last kind of two and a half years. Um, that's normally where I'll first go. It's the easiest place to find. Most people's Instagram is uh, private and is more kind of personal. Um, it's it's that main kind of professional social media front page and I will always go and look and see what's kind of happening on their Twitter profile. Um, so I would say bear that in mind, um, especially in terms of speaking about publications uh, where you work, currently work, or will never work in the future because you've said something absolutely awful about them, um, people will find it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of my advice on that one. And also it's, we're coming to a point now where I'm hiring people that don't have Twitter because they're just too young for it. Um, and 
I one of the people on my team that we hired uh, last year she didn't have Twitter um, but actually she got it because it was kind of so integral to our newsroom in terms of sharing our stories and, and videos and articles um, and now she just uses that as a kind of a portfolio of the pieces she puts together she's had a big increase in followers um, and interactions as well and that's fine if that's all you want to use it for but kind of keep it consistent and, and keep it going. Uh, some examples there we've got uh, Hugo who's our po politics editor at the eye um, he got he became our unofficial vaccine um, editor during the pandemic uh, because every day at, at 2 p.m he would announce the vaccine numbers and the case numbers and he would just kind of get that info directly tweet it um, and it did it didn't help our page views at all but it really boosted his follower account um, and it meant that people were literally that I had my friends texting me going um, is Hugo working today because he's not tweeted the vaccine numbers or the case numbers so can can you can you tell him to do it because I'm, I'm waiting for them um, so he kind of became a name in himself in, in doing that um, and that was just because he did it every day at the same time I built up that kind of following he now uh, is still really good at sharing his articles um, kind of some politics reporters aren't that great um, on, at, on knowing how to do it, but he'll always kind of try and be quite engaging, use of emojis, he's tagged in the eye paper there, he's basically done everything right in that tweet, and um, big pat on the back for me for that one. Um, there's my one from the other day, just retweeting our um, account, we were sharing images from the funeral, um, and it was just a sad royal horsey. It's like one of the saddest moments of the day. Just very sad. The Queen's pony coming out to see the um, procession. Um, but yeah, just engaging with the news, even if you are so snowed under with doing something else, kind of just try to stay on top of that coverage and just being like, I'm here, like in case my followers actually want to know something about the funeral and you've maybe missed it from everyone else. Here's me sharing some of our coverage. Um, and then also, uh, so we've got uh, Dave Jorgensen here from who is best known as the Washington Post TikTok guy. Um, and it shows that you can use content from other social media platforms on your Twitter. Um, all he does is share TikToks, but that is a video and that is a media tweet and that is gonna get good engagement. Um, and they're just really, really shareable and, and quite good. So it's kind of a good way to bridge that gap and bring people to TikTok or bring TikTok to people who don't necessarily use it. Hashtags. Um, so um, when I first started using Twitter, hashtags were literally everywhere. Everyone was obsessed with them. Um, people started saying it out loud. So hashtag this, hashtag that, awful. Um, but thankfully Twitter has now shifted um, to using keyword search. So we don't have to rely on hashtags. And so you can see that tweet that I've done a mock tweet of in the top right there, which actually gives me the ick a little bit now. Uh, follow for the hashtag latest news and hashtag updates on the que hashtag Queen's Funeral and hashtag procession to hashtag Windsor Castle. That's how we used to tweet. That's sickening. <laughs> and really, really gives me the ick now. Thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. Um, and it's so much better. So you can literally just say words in your tweets that becomes a keyword search and it will even take those words and turn them into trending topics without the need for a hashtag. It's great. I love it. Um, I still have to have conversations with people that they don't need to hashtag everything um, and probably will be for the foreseeable future, but it's just great that we don't have to do that anymore. They are still useful, however, for specific things. Um, so to reach specific audiences, a group of people, they are really good at kind of nailing that engagement and nailing kind of people finding your tweets about it. Um, so for example, album release days, normally when there's like a new album from a big artist, there will be a hashtag related to that or probably have a cool little emoji in it. Um, and fans will be sitting on that hashtag, just waiting to jump on any hate <laughs> or love for the piece. <laughs> Um, so that's what we tend to use when we share like our album reviews and um, the last time Taylor Swift did an album release um, our review went quite big from our main account because we used that hashtag that got shared quite widely um, we panned uh, Louis from One Direction's album using his hashtag tweet and hashtag sorry um, and that went quite big just because his fans were not happy about it but we found that audience so you know 
um, swings and roundabouts. It's also good for world days. So uh, today is World Alzheimer's Day. Um, you can see this tweet from the United Nations that was on the trending page on Twitter. Um, that's a good way to use it. So if you're doing specific coverage of it, either on that specific day or in the lead up, um, that's a really good way to kind of share content. If it's something you've written in the past, that's actually like, oh, I did an amazing interview um, with somebody who's done Alzheimer's research. I'll share that again today. It might be the day that it goes viral, uh, even if it's kind of missed its chance when you previously published it. So that's kind of another good thing to look out for, see what kind of the day is. Um, and then also around kind of TV or sport events. So obviously Great British Bake Off started off, everyone knows hashtag DVBO. Um, and that can kind of, if you jump on that when you're watching it, um, that can kind of get lots of shares and support that. So hashtags, not how they used to be, but still very useful um, and still very good for kind of uh, journalists working by themselves, but also organizations too. Format trends. Um, so as things fall in and out of fashion, uh, so they do on Twitter as well. Um, and it's just always the way there's probably, I could probably do an entire presentation on the trends of how to post on Twitter. Um, hint, hint, Ian, I'm joking. Um, Cause it is fascinating how things change. Um, and they do, they do kind of fall into this rut of how people are sharing things and they work for a, a small period of time. And then it's almost like Twitter then goes, oh, oh no, these, this is cheating. <laughs> we'll change this now. We don't, we don't support these. Um, the one at the moment um, is uh, what myself and a couple of my colleagues have entitled the hashtag thread bros, um, which come from kind of marketing uh, backgrounds, uh, nothing against marketing, um, but there is a specific type of thread bro at the moment on Twitter. Um, they all have this um, black and white, um, a picture on a colored background. Absolutely nothing against Rob Lennon. Rob, if you're watching this, love the work. You're doing a great job um, because your tweets are getting huge engagement and it's working. Um, and if you go onto Rob's profile, it suggests other Twitter accounts that are related. There, there are about 50 other accounts there that either had yellow backgrounds, purple backgrounds, blue backgrounds. I don't know if they've all been to the same seminar and all got the same headshots. Um, but it seems like it. And they, they, I think they're all in the same WhatsApp group because they're all retweeting each other all over the place. Um, they basically do these tweets that are very kind of spaced out, short, sharp, choppy. I've got the answer to all your problems. Read my thread. Um, it's very simple. It's very effective. Um, it does increase your engagement. Um, it can encourage you to tell your story in a different way. Um, and it's just kind of nice to kind of try it out and test it and see if it does work. We have started trying this out in our threads from the main account and um, just to kind of be short, sharper, snappier. We're not as clickbaity as these tend to be. Um, and we do usually end our kind of <laughs> advice that we're giving um, and are more specific. Um, but yeah, it's you might have seen these about um, and, and just have a little look and see if you'll see them now. Uh, cropping up on your Twitter feed um, and have a little dig into them. There's lots of like into sharing and this is the answer to this and here's the top 10 tips on how to write. And it's like, get a pencil and some paper. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the trend that I've, I've spotted at the moment. Uh, that's interesting, it's fascinating. And it will be gone in like two months, six months, um, just like politics for all. Um, there was also football for all, uh, news for all, um, and there's a really good uh, Guardian long read about politics for all and the fall of it. If you haven't read it, go and read it. It's just very interesting about kind of where it came from, how it kind of dominated uh, Twitter for ages, wound up every single newsroom, because as you can see from this, they would tweet breaking, then a headline. Um, and that would be your headline, that would be your reporter's headline that they'd spent months researching and they wouldn't link to the piece. Um, and it would kind of go out and then that tweet would get the full engagement, the full attention. And then about 20 minutes later, they'd go, oh, and here's the link. Um, which was very frustrating 
um, <laughs> for quite a lot of newsrooms. Um, and but also very effective, very clever, very smart. They grew very, very quickly. Um, it was a very big thing during the pandemic. It was kind of how people read the news a lot of the time. Um, the amount of my friends that said, oh, I saw on politics for all. And I'd be like, no, shh, don't don't say that. <laughs> that's uh, that's not what we want here. Um, but yeah, and that's how they did it. And they did they did very well from it. So that was kind of a trend for a while. And then they were shut down. Um, but yeah, go and read read the Guardian long read about I think it's called like the fall of politics for all um it's really interesting um and yeah RIP threads um so other things you can do on Twitter are threads um I'd say they can be used for two main things uh first of all storytelling um you can use them to tell a single narrative or a, a way to connect stories on a specific topic um, you can use different types of tweets and tweet formats within that thread. I would encourage it. I would say um, use kind of varying levels of media or just text or links um, and polls as well. They always increase engagement. Um, and you can see, so the top right here is um, our special correspondent, Rob, um, just breaking down one of his long reads. So he's our kind of long read writer and does these like really intense investigations. Um, and he's now very good at breaking those investigations down from 2000 words into a series of tweets. And they're just very shareable, very readable. Um, it's a really nice way to do it. He's almost doing it like a thread bro in that one actually. So I approve. Um, so yeah, it's good to see you can thread that all. Um, and then that hopefully gets shared. Um, I know it can be frustrating as well because you've kind of got an article you've written, um, you are then, chopping it up and rewriting it and putting it on Twitter and why aren't people going to kind of your website to read it um that is an eternal problem I don't have the answer to that um but it's kind of personal preference and how you kind of want to present it if you just want to do like a few tweets you can do a mini what we call a mini thread um so just do like here's the key points here's an interesting part of it here's quite a strong quote then here's a link to the full article that you can read it or you can go all out and just put it all on Twitter. Um, it's a slightly, I'd say, don't just copy and paste from an article because it's just not the right tone. Um, and I'd just say, try and make it slightly more chatty, um, but still kind of obviously keeping it factual and to the piece. Um, and then the other thing that threads can be used for are compilations. So a like mini portfolio, like, um when I reached my three years at the iPaper I did a little like oh here's some of the things I'm most proud of I've worked on being here three years um here's one from our culture editor Sarah um so it was to the Mercury Prize nominees um and she then did a thread of all the interviews we've done with the Mercury Prize nominees over the last year or so um which was really interesting really of interest to people that were into Mercury Prize again like, there's a hashtag that's specific for that event um, that she's kind of jumped on, then that was kind of shared quite widely. There was people kind of reading those interviews. Um, and even if they're kind of six months old, it's still kind of relevant to, to that specific event. So that's a good way to kind of um, post your stuff. Um, and yeah, mini portfolios, pin them to the top of your profile. Um, if you're a freelancer, I know people that are freelance that do this, they'll put kind of their top pieces into a thread and then have that at the top of their Twitter profile. So it means that people that are prospective employers or um, looking for like shifters will then see kind of that. And it's it's just a nice way to kind of have a mini host of, of what you're doing and, and what you're capable of. You can then turn your threads into moments. Um, so this feature again was like a really, it was, it was created with news organizations in mind. Um, and we very much welcomed it because they are very, very helpful for traffic um, and it basically means that you can take that thread or just any collection of tweets and put it in one place under a headline and an image kind of like an article um, and it is then potentially hosted by Twitter and you can actually then share that kind of collection uh, from your account as well. Um, they don't have to be from the same account um, so the one to the right of the screen about Prince, um, 
about, sorry, the yeah, Prince of Wales. Uh, that was a moment created by our main account, but it includes tweets from uh, the writer who wrote that piece, also ones from the main account. Um, we'll do a mix of them. You'll often see Twitter produce their own on a specific event, and it will take sources from different kind of news organizations. So as we know, the that kind of core to building journalism is multiple sources, and you can do that within a moment. Um, you can also uh, break down specific events um, and just do ones from the like um, the main account or your account. Um, so example there that we did on Tuesday um, was a kind of a roundup of our, our politics pieces. So it was like politics is back. Here's everything you need to know about what's being announced this week. Um, what's kind of on ice, what you've maybe missed during the kind of last week of intense royal coverage. Um, and that, as you can see, that's just that screenshot there has got three different articles in it. And it was just a nice way to kind of like that compilation feel, really share our, our stuff in a way. And that was featured on uh, Twitter's um, Explore page, which I'll talk about uh, now. So the Explore tab. Um, so ultimately, you would like your moment to be featured on here. So you can see kind of top right, um, that's how it appears. Um, the Explore tab is basically like Twitter's news front page. Um, if you are on the Twitter app on your phone and you just click the little search um, button down the bottom, that will take you to the Explore page. Uh, on desktop, it is actually called Explore. Um, it is split into different categories. So you can see some there. So trending, again, that will kind of follow what people are talking about. Um, trending topics, trending hashtags. Uh, then it's split into news, sports, entertainment and COVID. Um, and these are largely managed by Twitter themselves. Um, and we'll kind of take articles that we think are quite shareable, uh, lend themselves to being a tweet. So they're quite long. They've got like different interviews, different components. Can we turn it into turn certain aspects of it and relate an emoji to that? Um, if it's quite dry, maybe not. Um, if it's quite fun, it's kind of the, the more shareable of pieces that will feature. Um, <clears throat> so as mentioned, there's our politics one uh, from yesterday um, that was kind of under the, the for you tab for me, because I obviously am constantly on the iPapers um, account, but also it was on the news tab as well. Uh, on entertainment, you can see there that it's got trending uh, topic so James Bond uh, married at first sight and then also Metro's a Holly Willoughby piece um, and then the GQ um, thread a moment about uh, Game of Thrones as well um, so you'll have seen these and probably got used to these kind of appearing on your Twitter for a long time uh, not a lot of us knew about this or how kind of effective it was um, and we were, we were like always like what is the telegraph just constantly on the explore tab how are they doing that um and then we started trialing with it last year um and find that it is really kind of good in sharing our stories um and then yeah now everyone does it so it's just kind of finding finding the way in that kind of suits you and I would say like as a journalist as always find the things that you're interested in write about those share those don't just do something for the sake of it because it's trending. Like if you don't have a good piece of content about that, you don't need to share it. Wait until you've got something that is actually then shareable by itself. Um, if you happen to have something that say like James Bond is trending and you've got an archive piece, which is an interview with Ian Fleming, and then that makes for, we can turn that into a thread, then that has potential to then land in that export app. Um, so how do you get on the export app? Um, there is a direct pitching email that you can send to Twitter that I believe is only limited to news organisations, um, but they are, they do have a team that kind of circle and will look out for moments that they can feature. Uh, cover a trending topic, as mentioned, that's a really good way in. Uh, make the thread engaging with a very clear structure. Uh, make sure it kind of tells the story and doesn't just kind of end abruptly or um, make sure it kind of links back to the article or the source. Um, and then also the headline is another thing that we've looked at quite a bit, which is kind of make that kind of short and grabby um, and not clickbait, but still kind of a slight tease in there. We have found that's wonders. 
<clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just gonna grab some water. Um, so that's it about moment threads and uh, on the explore tab. Uh, looking at some other features now, spaces. Um, so this was introduced uh, shockingly in the history of social media companies borrowing ideas from other companies. Um, this was introduced following the success of Clubhouse. Uh, I don't know if anyone used that, remembers that. <laughs> um, it had quite a, a period of fame and it's slightly died off um, now that the pandemic is hopefully behind us for a while. Um, and suddenly Twitter was like, oh, we have an audio feature now. Um, and everyone was like, oh, interesting. Um, and some places are doing it really well. New States that uses it, Telegraph again use it, um, and uh, Tortoise as well. A lot of places that kind of already have that podca podcast production in place have found it a, quite a simple way to kind of slip into and just be like, well, we're already recording this, so let's just do a live one. Um, and that was it, basically. It was a Twitter account hosting another group of journalists speaking about a specific topic. Um, the Telegraph will host every day a space about Ukraine. Um, they've obviously found that this does really well for them, that there is an interest. Um, no matter what the news is, they will host something about Ukraine. Um, and I, it's just, it's a worldwide issue that there is a lot of interest for. Maybe not just a UK audience, but a wider audience. Um, and that's kind of what they'll, they'll host their live spaces on a lot of the time. Other ones will kind of do shortened versions of podcasts for that week on specific topics. Um, and now the tab has been updated. If you've all got the Twitter app, there's now an audio button down the bottom. Um, and that will kind of take you to like a live audio um, space that sort of looks like the Google podcast app for people that have got Google phones. Um, and that now it's not just live audio anymore. It's kind of a library of it, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, what's been kind of discovered from using spaces, I think, by news organisations is that it is actually really good for uh, growing the profiles and the followers of uh, your journalists. Um, so if we were to do one from uh, our main account, uh, we may then uh, find that suddenly the journalist that was kind of on that um, space with us uh, suddenly had a jump of a thousand followers. Um, the science behind this, I don't know, but I think it is because Twitter really like you using spaces. So they will feature it at the top of your feed. If somebody you follow is doing a space, and you're on your Twitter feed, it is at the, at the top there. Um, so it's it's like when the olden days, when you'd go live on Facebook and everyone would get a notification for it, you're basically sending a notification to it and Twitter is making that happen uh, because it's a new feature and they like it and it's keeping people within the app. So they like that and they will therefore promote it. Um, so it definitely kind of is helping boost profiles and that sort of thing. Um, and we've not, used it yet at the eye um but are kind of keen to and also see kind of where it goes going forwards as well um so this is the new home for spaces that you'll see on your twitter account um it's got stations so yeah very similar to kind of the like uh bbc sounds app kind of that sort of feel um again you know just taking those ideas what works see how we can build it into our app um, and this is also determined by who you follow, um, topics as well. Uh, there's that function on Twitter where you can choose kind of the topics you're interested in. I feel like I did that years ago and no longer remember clicking any of them as one of mine is like archeology. span um, And yeah, uh, that's brought up loads of like history podcasts, which I was like, actually, that's quite interesting. Um, so yeah, just have a little look on there, see kind of what it means for you, what comes up for you. Um, and if you're interested, have a go at it, why not? Um, there's kind of whispers that it's gonna end up being a subscriber only function, um, but nothing confirmed yet. Uh, and it is still kind of free to air for everybody. Another new feature uh, that's been introduced by Twitter um in the last year or so uh it's communities um this is again 
very similar to another function we've seen, which is Facebook groups. Um, and it allows you to join, create, and communicate within specific groups of people or followers um, or Twitter users. Um, and actually, it's it's really good. I'm you can see I'm I'm in the audience journos one, um, which is quite exciting and means that some people from like the Washington Post follow me now. Amazing. Um, and that is just kind of really interesting. And you can kind of see the tweets that they do to their feed. There's also tweets that we kind of share just within that group. Um, a lot of the time it's help I'm hiring. Do you know anyone? <laughs> <laughs> um, but otherwise it's just kind of an interesting place and a safe space to ask really nerdy audience questions. Um, and yeah, and, and kind of what I've always said to reporters um, and how I used to use it when I was a reporter myself is like Facebook groups, um, it's a place where you can grow your specific audience if you are a patch reporter that focuses specifically on environment. Um, it's you can join those Facebook groups or these communities that are people really into like Greenpeace supporters or um, people that don't want another runway built at an airport. You can find those communities, join them. That means they're the people that are gonna read your stories. Um, they're the people you regularly write stories about and in turn, they're then the people that are then gonna trust you for that coverage and then come to you with stories. And it's just a nice cycle of reporting and news gathering um, and actually I think this is a really good addition to Twitter and um, some of my suggested ones uh, was the Bay Hive uh, which I don't think I would enter because that's quite a fierce fan base um, <laughs> and I love Beyonce but I wouldn't want to get into any arguments with those guys um, got Twitter cooking video creators um, there's literally a community for everything and anything you can have rules as you can see um, and I would say just have a little look and see how you can use them because if you are a patch reporter it's kind of those old school journalism things of just going and knocking on someone's door maybe that doesn't happen as much anymore but you could literally just dm them from them talking in that community um and you learning something or spotting something or thinking oh well, actually I need somebody for an article who has this viewpoint that'd be really interesting to hear from them and you just remember from months ago that somebody's dropped that into a community um so i would say have a little look for these and see if there's any based around something that you're writing about or interested in writing about um as that can be really helpful what's next um so there's a few different things that kind of in the works for twitter that you may have seen popping up on your feed or may have heard talk of um, so the first one is tiles, uh, which you can see here on this New York Times tweet, uh, which is basically just a new way to show links from websites, um, but they've now called them tiles. Um, so it's just a slightly more aesthetically pleasing article preview, uh, which has got the publication, the headline, the image, and anywhere you click in that box, that will take you directly to that article. Um, there's also functions on this where uh, you can do that with a newsletter and you can you can do sign up underneath it um, and then you can pin that to your profile um, the newsletter function as well you can kind of house on your profile itself um, and integrate that within your Twitter profile um, I believe I'm sorry the name of the, the newsletter function escapes me right now but it has to be a specific one so actually unfortunately that doesn't work with the newsletters we produce at the eye um, but it's if you happen to have a newsletter definitely check out the newsletter function um, there's also twitter right which I don't think has been talked about that much um, I don't really think it's going to take off that much uh, but it's interesting um, and this is basically where you can write on Twitter longer than the characters you're given for a tweet. It's kind of like uh, keep notes um, that you have on your phone um, and you can share these or keep them to yourselves. Again, it's where they're kind of building communities. So the example there is uh, around science um, and it's kind of like a bloggers space, um, which is interesting. Why not when you've got billions of dollars, try it out. Um, and yeah, I, that's kind of it as far as I know for now. I mean, TikTok have just announced like a Be Real feature. Um, who knows that might come to Twitter. I remember Fleets when they had like the stories function that they just borrowed from Instagram. 
Um, so yeah, it's going to be constantly changing. Um, and I quite like that Twitter aren't afraid to try it and then just fail <laughs> and then be like, fleets are going tomorrow. <laughs> You're like, okay. <laughs> um, there's also obviously some things that may take some time to come through um, just because of everything that's obviously happening with Elon Musk at the moment. Um, has, I know from conversations, put some things on hold. Um, so we, you may see an influx of developments or extensions of these things. Um, but uh, yeah, there's definitely things to come. Uh, that was it in terms of posting. Ian, did you want me to carry on with news gathering or did you want me to answer any questions around uh, what I've talked about so far? I think Tasha, you probably want a, a little bit of a break. So we just let you have a, a minute just for a break and we'll um, see if there are any questions at this point. So uh, about the features, anyone got any questions either here in the room or uh, those of you who are watching us remotely? <laughs> Any questions uh, either? Yes, I've got a question here in the room. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Tash, did you hear that? No, I didn't. Could you repeat it for so me? The, the question is which of the, you know, from the features that we've just been looking at, um, which do you think is going to be the, the, the biggest, really, or the most? The next, the next trending one you think is you know, from those that we've discussed? I think potentially spaces, just because it, I think the extension to audio is still happening. I know there was kind of obviously a big audio boom in the last couple of years. I think spaces is definitely something I really want to try. Um, I know someone's actually put in the chat that um, they've listened to some good ones and some bad ones. Um, and yeah, I think there is a variety of them at the moment. Um, so I think there, there might be easier ways to do that. Um, I really like communities, but again, that's kind of more of a tool rather than kind of a growth thing or a trending thing. Um, and I'm hoping moments will, will stick around and maybe become slightly more interactive um, and intuitive as well. Thank you for that question. Yes, another one here. Uh, I think that I already mentioned that Twitter is not as popular as it used to be. So, the question is whether she thinks it's gonna go down with in engagement because it is good for journalists, as she said, but people are not really on Twitter as they used to be. They move to other social medias. Uh, does she think that it's gonna change something that the journalists are gonna move to another social media app or are they gonna continue using Twitter? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, Tash, um, given what you said right at the outset about, um, you know, a younger generation not using Twitter as much as mm -hmm. the older generations, is it worth investing time into Twitter right now? I think so. I think there still is. Like, I think, um, I mean, journalists will be on whatever profile they can use a social platform they can use to kind of talk about themselves because journalists love doing that um uh, but I think inevitably they will have to kind of follow the audience and go to where their audience is um and I think Twitter's got kind of a longer life in it Facebook has definitely dropped off um and but I don't think the, the huge boom that Facebook was for like referrals and page views and and, and readers Twitter isn't going to suddenly take that on. Twitter's probably just going to kind of stay where it is right now. Um, and it's probably got a few more years until the, the next platform that kind of knocks its socks off. Um, but at the moment, I don't think there's anything that kind of is as text-based and um, fast-paced as Twitter uh, for that kind of live reporting or news gathering. Um, I mean, like there are things that are challenging it, like TikTok, Instagram completely. Um, but I think it's fine for at least another few years um, and won't be obsolete just yet. Um, but yeah, ultimately, the, the, a journalist needs to kind of service an audience. And if, if it just ends up being a place where there's just journalists, it's of no use to anyone. So um, and also not a nice place to be. So <laughs> it would just be the same thing over and over again. Um, so I think, yeah, sorry if that was a round. Yeah, I, I guess one point worth mentioning Tash is that 
the skills that we use in Twitter will you know, and learning how to use Twitter will serve us well when we come to using other platforms. It's not as if the kind of skills you're using when you're posting on Twitter and using moments and using lists or sorry communities and spaces you know are wasted you know uh, th those are skills that will be transferable to other platforms when they emerge definitely and social media companies will keep stealing new ideas and new developments to stay relevant um i talked about it a bit in the instagram masterclass i did but the way in which instagram has like developed like i love it but also hate it but it has stayed very relevant among like a core younger audience um and Twitter maybe is just slightly more angled toward journalists and a, a little bit of an older audience, um, but they will kind of fight for that survival and, and keep just borrowing those ideas until it doesn't work anymore. We've got one more question in the room. But before I come to a couple of questions in the room, I'm just gonna um, ask a couple of questions that have appeared um, from our audience uh, online. Um, so Simon's asking, is there a big difference between communities and lists? Um, yeah, so I, I talk about lists in a little bit, in about, in one slide's time. Um, but yeah, so I would say communities are private, lists are public. Um, lists are just a collection of people that you can like follow. Um, and I would say are better for updates. Um, maybe not for like engagement and that kind of closed engagement um they are similar um but i do think they can kind of serve different purposes so i would say communities is maybe good for not just news gathering but posting as well whereas lists i would say are very useful for like just news gathering and a little bit how i have my list is more like a kind of contact book and it's kind of by those people and so i'll show you in a sec but we've got ones that are just uh i journalists or our columnists um and you can just categorize people and then and then watch them and, and kind of follow them for kind of news and updates thank you and jasmine's saying uh, because we're, we're going to talk about news gathering in a moment jasmine's saying well so far uh, she's only used it uh, twitter for news gathering never posted um on twitter as a journalist before how should how should she start is there a kind of a uh, a good sort of safe entry point um I like that being a I'd love to just be a Twitter lurker I think that's what I'd do now if I was just joining you um but yeah I, I I think just be as upfront and as mentioned kind of as yourself in a professional sense as you want to be so just kind of introduce yourself what are you up to what are you doing give a little bit on your profile um and then just it's it's honestly up to you but sharing just articles and pieces you've written or things that interest you it can be as controversial or not controversial as you want um and just put in as much or little effort as you want really if you've got like 10 minutes in a day schedule 10 tweets to go out in a week that are 10 articles you've read that you find really interesting and then you've kind of scheduled those every day and you don't have to think about it and you've just populated your profile and it looks like you're a consistent tweeter um but actually you've just done that because you had 15 minutes there um but i would say don't jump fully in and and um if you're slightly nervous about it maybe just see how people you follow do it if there's somebody you admire that's a journalist um see how they're tweeting and just kind of kind of go from that but just stay kind of true to yourself don't do anything that obviously makes you feel uncomfortable thank you tash and then just a couple of final questions from our room yes yeah, um in the past few years there's been a lot of distrust in twitter especially with fake news and people violating how they use twitter so it's interesting hearing that journalists use it as well to their advantage so like do you think that Twitter will become a platform that's more regulated um, in the future because of all this sort of um, you know, like swimming in this. Okay, so do you, want to, do you want to, thank you for that. Do you want to just have a think about that, Tash, and then I'll just round up the other couple of questions, if that's all right? Yeah, sure. On, on that one, I do have a slide coming up about verification um, that might kind of cover that a little bit. Um, yeah. But I would, I would say in how receptive they are to journalists, they have tackled it like fake news more than other places have um but 
there are obviously are still terrible parts of Twitter as they're still terrible parts of the internet. Um, and I think, but I do think they have done well in not trying to kind of become a news publisher themselves. And they've still left a lot of it to the journalists, which is obviously how kind of Facebook fell off slightly and just allowing people to pay for anything to be posted on there. Um, whereas Twitter still have kind of that step back um, which is definitely maintained by the relationship they do have with, with journalists. But obviously, it's still there's still things that are absolutely terrible. Thank you, Tash. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a practical question, really. I've been on Twitter for a few years. I follow just shy of 5,000 people and just shy of 3,000 follow me. But Twitter won't let me follow more people until I've got more followers and I'm just kind of stuck on this 3000 level and short of suddenly trending, I'm not sure how that's going to alter. And yet I think some people manage to do it without, manage to follow more without having right. more followers. Oh, okay. Tash, did, um, have you come across that issue? I actually haven't. Um, no, I would say, I don't know the answer to that one, but I would get in touch with like Twitter support and flag that you're a journalist. Um, obviously, like going through a social media platform support uh, a pan portal can be very frustrating. Um, but I would, they do try and rush through stuff for journalists. So I would just flag like what's happening and, you know, that it's detrimental to your news gathering efforts and, uh, and just kind of amp up a little bit in that way and then hopefully they can help you but I've not actually come across that so apologies I can't assist with that one that's really helpful and how, how do you how do you know that I mean have you got a message that comes back when you try to when you reach 5,000 that you're following it says you can't follow any anyone else unless you unfollow some people oh wow so then you've got to kind of sit through and decide who you're gonna unfollow it's normally the people who aren't following you, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Quite a tedious process. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, it, it, is, is that to do with people abusing it by trying to get more followers by, by following other people? Do you think that's, that's the reason, Tash? Maybe. I'm, I genuinely don't know. No, I'm sorry. Okay. You see, I'd understand it if there was a huge disparity between the numbers I follow and vice versa. Yeah. 3,000 to 5,000. The only thing I can think is that it's they do try and kind of combat bots. So maybe there's some people that follow you that are like fake accounts. Um, but obviously that's not your fault. So I yeah, I I definitely try and get them to have a look at that for sure. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, a final profiles, how you should reflect you as a journalist and a person. Um, the idea of switching to like a professional profile. So I haven't really used Twitter since about 2016, but I've lived for years. And I think it's a great tool for finding out information as a brilliant, which is great. But um, there's also an aspect of, um, I went through my tweets and I was very, I'm very concerned, concerned about like my social media footprint, and stuff I've said in the past, because you hear about a lot of cancel that unfortunately there wasn't anything that stood out where I was just like, you need to delete that. But do you know of any sort of like automated tools? Because some of it's just irrelevant and a bit cringy because it's 2016. Like I've changed a lot and um, and my interests and stuff have changed a lot. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I know people definitely still get burnt, and that's kind of um I know of instances where, like as I said, recruiters will look at your profiles. Um, if it is a senior role in a newsroom, like and it would be a then story for other publications of those tweets and bad tweets in the past, um, then those are searched for uh, from doing it myself. Um, there isn't like a specific way of doing it. I, I think there used to be a way to kind of delete everything back from a time period. Um, but I would say, like when I've done it before or been kind of investigating somebody it's I've done had to do specific word searches myself um that are obviously problematic um to just check in case they've done any of those um but I would say that unfortunately there isn't like an easy fix to it um it might just be you have to kind of go back and have a look um or just check because there did used to be a function with Twitter where you could archive stuff, um, but I don't know if that still exists. 
unfortunately sorry if that's not very helpful <laughs> um but yeah if there's like specific things that you're worried about um I would kind of try and do a search term that um like if you support a specific football team and you've just got a thousand tweets of you saying fuck because they keep missing <laughs> the, like the goal from 2016 then maybe search that football team and then delete all the tweets related to that um uh, but yeah that's I know that's not easy um but that's kind of the only way around it I would see right now it's not so much about like stuff I've tweeted in the past because I've gone back to day dot and I've been like oh, fine um but I'd also like there's a lot of stuff from when I was growing up I like to keep I've tweeted out and stuff it's like it is quite a good way of like tracking sort of what you were doing at the time so like mm -hmm. Say probably it's worth archiving it and then maybe just going through and just sifting through and doing that because a lot, like I say, a lot of it is not professional in the way it could cause an offence, but it's just irrelevant now. And it's just, yeah. Like, if you want to lend yourself to being quite a credible person, it doesn't matter if you're a professional, it doesn't look very professional, but all of a sudden you start tweeting in 2022 when the last tweet was in like 2016. And it was about, like, I mean, it entirely depends what you're using it for, but like you can just like start a new account and then go that way and then promote that new account by your old one um and then it's just a completely like clean slate um but yeah they're probably just the two kind of ways i i deal with it um i have a an account that i have delete like that still exists but it's private so no one can see it and um, the account that i was tweeting about my breakup for that my uh lecturer called me out for um, and that's just kind of a that I've not tweeted from there since like 2014. So that's just kind of floating in space, but no one can see that. So it's you can like make it private um, and then delete followers and, and do it that way as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you for the question. Thank you, Tash. And just before we let you go on, uh, we've had a couple of people just jumping in on that, uh, you know, how to uh, follow more people. Uh, some people are saying if you use lists, so you add some of your followers uh, add them to lists and then they don't count as followed. Um, so maybe um, uh, maybe that might be uh, some way to, to deal with it. Okay, Tash, um, thank you. Do you want to carry on with the slides? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for those questions, guys. They were really good. Um, so yeah, news gathering. Um, so this is the other part that uh, Twitter is really good for <laughs> and kind of has progressed over time um, and there's so many ways that you could use it um, but I'm going to touch on a couple that kind of I've used in the past I know reporters kind of still use um, and apologies I've not been a reporter for a while <laughs> um, but these are occasional things that um, staff in our newsroom use um, so there might be things that you use that I'd be really interested to hear about as well at the end um, and do let me know um, but these are ones that we that have found kind of useful in the past and in passing on to uh, people in the newsroom at the moment. Um, so, yeah, so as mentioned, uh, lists are a great way to sort out the people you follow um, and kind of assist in, in your reporting. Um, I remember explaining this to a reporter in a newsroom uh, that I worked in and he'd worked at this local newspaper for like 30 years. Um, and I showed him tweet deck for the first time and he was literally like, so it's like a contacts book, but on Twitter. And I was like, yes, yes, Clive, that is what it is. It's great. Um, and that's that again, that's always stuck with me. And I really like that. So yeah, it's, it's a way to organize your contacts. Um, and you can do it in a way that kind of helps your reporting, helps your sharing of articles. So I, I've always got, so as you can see, this is the iPapers list. We've got iJournalists, iContributors, and then our, our politics reporters. And it just means we can have a constant kind of flow of, of these lists up and I can kind of I can see what everyone's tweeting, uh, which I do let people know <laughs> that I constantly see what they're tweeting. Um, but also you can kind of keep on top of them, retweet what they're saying, share that out, um, which is just a really nice way to kind of organise that. Um, you can do it by like emergency services. That was kind of good when I was a news reporter. Um, and then experts as well. So again, if you're that patch reporter um, and you follow like scientists or uh, people that are experts in a specific area, you can kind of group them all together. Um, as mentioned, lists are public. Um, so when you add somebody to a list, 
um, they are notified. So I would avoid doing anything that is like, are oh, the journalists that really annoy me on Twitter. Uh, and then adding people to that because they will get a notification saying, you've been added to the, the really annoying journalist Twitter list. Um, and they'll see who's done that. So just a warning on that. But the good side to that is that you can check uh, what lists you're on. And if you're added to lists, um, and this is something I've looked at in the past with our contributors or journalists that have maybe got a sustained level of like trolling um and they're like it's just it just won't stop it won't stop and the first thing I ask is have you been added to any twitter lists recently um because a lot of the time if you kind of upset a specific group of people they will have twitter lists that they will then share with people within that community um and then they can just do sustained kind of attacks on you from those accounts um, and how you do that is you go to your profile, go to lists, and then you can actually just see it in the top right hand corner there, those three dots. If you click on that, it will say lists you're on, and you can then see the lists that people have added you to, because obviously you're not always going to have a note, like spot a notification when it comes through, or it might be you're on a list that's like, 10 years old and you didn't realize you were on it um but that's a good way and it's also a good way to see kind of who your followers are um and how they view you and what they kind of use you for um and yeah so I would say um if you have quite a large following go and check out what lists you're on um and what lists you have and kind of how you can use them um so tweet deck um the holy grail um, which I really relied on uh, when I was a reporter that I kind of encourage all my reporters to try out and just have kind of one set up. Um, it basically allows you to have kind of your own personal personal social dashboard um, relating to like subjects and topics which matter to you and your work. Um, it is uh, better to use on it, what well, you can only use it on desktop. Um, and it's a really good way to kind of break up your searches rather than just having a constant news feed of tweets coming through. Um, it's split into different columns, which basically have the same setup as the main Twitter news feed. Um, and you can split these into different search terms um, and different uh, users. So you can do a user and all their tweets. Um, so you could have just, I'll just have mine up and I can see everything that I've tweeted. I can see everything that the iPaper has tweeted from the main account. Um, and that's just kind of useful just to kind of keep track on stuff. If you're reporting on a story on a specific company or a person, you can just kind of see their tweets coming through. Um, I mean, Trump, when he was on Twitter, um, you could just always have that up and have entertainment to see what he was tweeting next because you just never knew. Um, but you kind of see that first because it would be on your tweet deck. Um, you can also do mentions of other accounts. Um, so obviously we have seen um, like news stories around like delays and, and things kind of not working. Um, so you could pick a holiday company and get a column set up of people just messaging that holiday company and saying, hi, my flight's delayed. What's happening? What are you doing? Um, obviously a lot, this happened a lot when there was all the baggage delays at like Gatwick. Um, and you could kind of keep track of people that were applying to the Twitter account being like, where's my bags, where's my bags, where's my bags, where's my bags, <laughs> just constant. Um, but they're obviously then potential people that you can chat to if you're putting a new story together on those baggage delays. Um, you can then just reply to them and be like, hey, um, are you around for like a 10 minute chat? Um, and if they're literally just like a normal person who probably doesn't use Twitter that much, but will use it to complain to somebody. They're then somebody that you can get in touch with and maybe they'll speak to you. Um, you can also uh, do columns of likes by specific accounts. So you could pick um, a specific person or a company and set the filter to them, the likes that they do on Twitter. Um, an example of this is an MP who was uh, discovered a few years ago that he just kept liking porn tweets, um, which is obviously very inappropriate. <laughs> um, and I believe this was only discovered because somebody had just set up an alert previously um, about what that a couple of MPs were like liking on Twitter because somebody had mentioned it. 
uh, and they were like, oh, I'll, I'll see, I'll keep an eye on it. And then lo and behold, literally within a couple of hours, um, there were some naughty things being liked very inappropriately. And you've got a story. Um, search terms as well. That's another thing that you can set up a column for. Um, these can be kind of relating to specific incidents, um, but bear in mind that people often don't tweet in search terms. Um, so literally if there's a fire somewhere and you want to find out more about it, most people aren't going to tweet, oh, there is a fire on this specific road. It started at this specific time. Um, this many people are believed to have been evacuated. That's obviously your job to eventually get those details and put them together. Um, a lot of the time, actually, it's quite good to search for like expletives and exclamations and with like a specific like search word. So if there's a big fire somewhere, look for like fuck fire because um, that will be someone that will be like, oh, this is happening or like OMG, massive fire. Um, and that might actually come up with people that are, are literally there seeing it. Um, and that's just that's something I've actually found useful in the past, just kind of starting off to search terms with like OMG or like a swear word um, and doing it that way. Um, I'll come back to this one, but this is what my tweet deck looks like uh, for my personal account. Um, so as you can see, it's quite a nice layout. Uh, on the far left, got my home feed, which is just like the general um, Twitter feed that kind of comes up when you go on twitter.com. Uh, notifications, uh, that's kind of obviously self-explanatory, that's notifications coming to the tweets that I've done. Uh, then you can see I've got a user column, which is all the iPaper tweets. So um, I literally just put at the iPaper uh, and then that's now gonna filter every single thing that comes from the iPaper's account into that column. Um, I've made a column of the iJournalist list that even though that was created by the iPaper, because that's a public list, I can make a column of that. So um, if you're building one of these, definitely check in and see what lists other kind of accounts have. And it might be ones that you kind of want to follow and, and do this with. Um, so then other ones, we've got uh, BBC Breaking, uh, Sky News Breaking. Um, and then also I actually have specific lists that I created of police forces, uh, police dogs and uh, their kind of units. Uh, fire stations, ambulances, um, very much indicative of my time as a news reporter <laughs> and just trying to kind of see what's happening everywhere. Um, when I was a local reporter, I had lists on specific like boroughs. Um, so I had uh, like the, all the beat officers, uh, some of them had accounts and I kind of split those into lists. Um, so I was a, like a specific patch reporter. Uh, for a town and I had each kind of area of that town I had a different kind of emergency list for each of those um, it's just kind of a good way as well to kind of check in first thing and see what's happening um, I don't know if there's reporters on this call that still do this but when I first started you had to do the morning ring round um, and calling all the fire stations uh, any of the police contacts who would talk to you <laughs> um, or any of the like ambulance stations and just being like hi has anything happened overnight um, and it's kind this is kind of a cheap way to do that because you'll wake up and there'll be tweets about that incident from overnight um, and it is kind of that very much that that contacts but that live feed of, of what those contacts are saying on on specific things um, so yeah that is that's my one um, and then you can see on the left hand side here, you've got the uh, menu and you can see just you add a column and then that will come up with the different types that you have. So um, I'd have to have a play with that and see if you find it useful. Um, if not, it's just something fun to have done once and then you might just end up using it in future. Um, another thing you can do with it uh, is geolocation. Um, so again, I use this quite a bit when I was a uh, breaking news reporter. Um, and you can narrow down a search to a specific location um, and source content from people reacting within that place. Uh, first of all, yes, that is creepy. Yes, you should turn off the location of your tweets <laughs> because people can do this and see where you're tweeting. Um, and that is why location on tweets is maybe something you want to do or maybe something you don't want to do, uh, but just something to think about. Um, you basically do this by finding the, so an example, sorry, 
of uh, using this uh, was uh, one of a terror attack that happened in a European city. Um, I was covering it for the standard and uh, we needed to find kind of witness, uh, witness like testimony from what was happening. Um, so we found, went onto Google Maps, found the location. Um, if you drop a pin on Google Maps um, and right click, it will give you the longitude and latitude for that location. Um, I don't know if you want to take this down, but so you do geocode, semicolon, put the longitude and latitude, get rid of the space in the middle, um, and then do another comma and do like a radius search area. So you could do um, a longitude, latitude, and then like two kilometers. So the one example I've got here is around the offices uh, for the eye in Kensington. So that's the longitude and latitude for Derry Street where we work and a search radius of two kilometers around it. And you can make that as small or as large as you need to. If you're obviously looking like for a specific event that's happened, the smaller and more concentrated, the better. Um, and for when I was covering um, a couple of uh, terror attacks, this was again, then we use that search code for that location. Um, you could then, depending on the concentration of people in that area, people using Twitter, you'd then just have a column that was constantly updating with tweets from that area. Um, or you can then add further search terms, such as, as mentioned, those kind of keywords, expletives, and you're getting kind of live updates of what's happening in that moment. I would say that was probably very, very useful um, about five years ago. Um, now with less people on Twitter, it's maybe not as handy, but it's still good to do it. Check, see if anything's happening. Um, obviously not just specific to terror attacks. <laughs> um, it's, it can be like events going on. Um, you could do it if Glastonbury is happening, just do geolocation of Glastonbury, see what people are tweeting from inside to find if you were doing like the top 10 best tweets that you've not seen from Glastonbury. Um, you could do it that way. Um, it's just a handy thing to look at. Um, so yeah. um, another way to search for things on Twitter is the advanced search. Um, this is useful for, again, this is probably how I would look at my previous tweets and just check there's nothing in there that I don't want there. Because um, you can search by phrase, words, hashtags, um, time period um, so you can literally um, if you just scroll down that there's a time period that you can look um, and see kind of what what was tweeted then um, there was like a trend about a year ago and it was like what did you tweet on your first day of like uni or something um, so I went back and found that immediately regretted it never wanted to look at it again because it's just embarrassing um, but it is just another way to kind of look for stuff um, if you don't have TweetDeck set up and you do want to kind of have a look for something. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's just uh, twitter.com uh, slash search dash advanced. Um, you can also search for tweets that mention your reporting. So if you've got an online article, you can copy the URL of your article, paste that into the search bar, and then that will show all of the um, tweets that are sharing your article. So if that's suddenly gone like huge on traffic and you can see that it's from Twitter, you can then find who's tweeting it and maybe what they say, depending on what the vibe is <laughs> and if you actually want to see that. That's just another handy tool that's slightly more in-depth than the main search bar on Twitter. Um, so yeah, so verification. Um, again, I feel like this is something that now a lot of people will be like, obviously um but there was a time when social media was new to people and still is to some and the most obvious things uh can be overlooked um we've actually had a couple of instances uh, the last couple of weeks in the newsroom um but also nothing to be ashamed of everyone can kind of get fooled or or duped at any time and um, it's just that's why it's always good to maybe have a second pair of eyes check something for you um, so I would say take the time to trust absolutely nothing, uh, especially when you're covering breaking or developing news. Um, uh, first of all, watch out for copycat images. Uh, one of the old kind of cons, I guess, on Twitter is people being like, oh, look at this crowd of people. And it's actually not from that specific thing. It's a crowd from 
another incident five years previously. Um, a good way to check that, there's obviously, again, we could do a whole presentation on looking up at, like fake images, but do a reverse Google image search on a picture. That will then, so you right click, um, it will show you the, I think it's at the bottom of the menu that comes up. And then that will do a Google search and show you that image where it's kind of landed. If that image has no other searches on it, it's a new picture most of the time. Um, it's probably amazing the amount of times you see something on your feed and don't realize that it's actually from something completely different and you just kind of accept it for what it is. So just keep an eye out for those. Um, again, another one that's kind of quite prevalent that's, that does happen is group pictures of, of missing people or fake pleas for missing people. Um, and again, why? I don't know why people do this. They want to get tweets shared. <laughs> It's just really strange. Um, but like fake missing persons. Um, during incidents, people will make fake uh, like multi uh, image collages of people. All oh, these are all the people missing currently after this incident. It happened after the Manchester Arena bombings and an image was circulated around. Um, and the worst thing is, and obviously the best lies have an element of truth in, it had pictures of, of actual victims in it alongside pictures of just random people from the internet and so it was just it's a kind of worst nightmare thing but just take don't take everything at face value like look further there's a, there's a guy in it I've actually got it in a sec and he he's got like a viral video from like 20 no 2009 talking about chicken wings and I was like that's the chicken wing guy why he's from like South America why is he he wouldn't be there and it's just it's just always question it always be on the lookout um the also take an extra look at like tweets being shared if somebody isn't retweeting somebody and they are sharing an image of a tweet just double check that does it look like a real tweet does it look too long does it look too short is the font wrong um does that actually look like something that somebody would have shared um i just say always question it um another one is newly opened twitter accounts uh, this is the one that caught uh, somebody in our newsroom this week. Uh, so obviously we had the um, uh, coffin bearers for the Queen and everyone was just like, oh, these these guys are amazing. They're, they're just like, everyone was kind of in awe of them and everything they'd done in, on that day for the funeral. Um, and then suddenly this account that had been started in September 2020 was talking about how proud they were of their son. Um, and, oh no, husband, sorry. Um, and one of our news editors was like, oh, it's a wife. It's a wife of one of the pearl bearers. And we're like, mm, I don't think it is, but <laughs> it, that is easy to do. And you could see kind of loads of people were replying to this, this woman that had no profile picture, no cover image. She hadn't tweeted anything else other than that day. Um, and was then when she was, she started replying to people um, saying, no, no, we've agreed as a family not to speak out. Um, and then it obviously then became a bit too much for this person because very quickly that account disappeared. Um, so just kind of be on the lookout. So go to their profile. How long have they been on Twitter for? How much have they tweeted? Um, and I would say just in general, don't retweet someone if you don't recognize them go and have a look at their profile because they might be tweeting something in that moment you agree with but you can then go on their website their website sorry their profile uh and find very problematic tweets that you have made yourself associated with because by retweeting them you've endorsed them and that is obviously a continuing issue with twitter and other social platforms and um, but i would say as a journalist always check who you're retweeting uh check the source always um, and yeah, just because someone has a blue tick doesn't mean they're reliable. Um, there was a Strictly dancer who shared a like viral fake video of a plane like landing, but doing like a loop the loop. Um, and he was verified and was sharing a very clearly fake video. Um, but yeah, in general, use your common sense. Does it look real? If it doesn't, ask why it's not real. What's the matter with it? Um, ask someone else to have a look. Um, and discuss it with your colleagues, discuss it with your friends, just be like, is this, is this right? Because most of the time, if you're questioning it, it's probably not. Um, so yeah. So yeah, some instances here. Um, this piece, uh, this was a very interesting day to work next to the Mail Online desk. 
uh, when there was the Oxford Circus incident um, and somebody embedded a tweet in an article that was actually 10 days old. Um, and it was, they basically thought they'd scooped that a lorry had driven into I think it was Selfridges. This is when Ollie Mers was tweeting on, from the changing rooms, if anyone remembers that, um, saying someone had a gun and they just didn't. Um, but yeah, somebody had seen this tweet. It had everything they needed. It had Oxford Circus, it had police, aftermath, crash, had all those buzzwords that you're like, yes, I'm reporting on this event. I found the tweet that has it all. Um, they had just failed to look at the date and it was actually not from that time and potentially not real either. Um, and that kind of went unnoticed. So always double check, no matter how much you're being hounded to get content on it. Um, this was the uh, images I was talking about. So from the Manchester bombings, um, I don't know if anyone recognizes the chicken wing guy, but he's the one in the suit. Um, and then there's just, it's just, obviously there are some of the victims in this, which just makes it just awful. Um, and then just other ones are just random, probably just from an image search and they've gone young person and then just taken those and made this, uh, that made it onto a, um, I think a mirror article. Um, so just kind of be careful with those. Um, and then again, just kind of questioning it. Like, oh yeah, Hurricane Harvey, are you following the hashtag, are you? And oh yeah, Jason's just shared this picture of a shark in, on the street with all the flooding. Is that likely? Probably not. Um, so just, yeah, double check that. And then actually I think that one uh, was looked at and uh, they, you could see it was very, quite clearly Photoshopped, um, but in a quite obvious way, it's like the water didn't match up and that sort of thing. So always check. Um, but once you have verified something as real and you think it's something you want to include in your journalism, um, you can then request to use it. Uh, I'd say, first of all, if you're working for a company, familiarise yourself with their policy. How do you approach people? How do they expect you to? Some places ask you to attach an image of their guidelines to the tweet that you send to them. So it will say, we now have the right to use this. Da, 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 da. And we'll have a list. Others will give you a link. Um, so just make sure you know who those are. Um, I would say tips with this. If it's a piece of content and you're the first to spot it and you think it's good for an article, uh, don't reply to that. So say it's a video um, and you're the first one to see it and it's somebody who's got a cat that can juggle and you're the first to see that video. Don't reply to the video because Twitter is a place for journalists and journalists follow other journalists. And other journalists are going to see you replying to that, that was your exclusive content. Um, and they're going to go, oh, we want that as well. And they're going to see your tweet and want that. So I would say, uh, go, so tweet them, just at them in a completely separate tweet. Say, I've seen your video on this. I'd really like to kind of get in touch with you and use this. Um, or if their DMs are open, send them a message. Uh, the amount of times I've done it, vice versa. I, I follow a lot of video editors on Twitter. Um, and I'll see them uh, replying to people and I'll then flag to our video editor and go, oh, Metro are jumping on this, have you seen this? Um, and then you've got it as well. It works both ways. Um, but if you want to avoid that, try and kind of go the back way to speaking to them. Um, on the flip side, if it is something that a lot of people are jumping on, um, so say we've got one here of uh, the uh, protester when the Queen was coughing, was coming through um, Edinburgh, and the guy shouted at Prince Andrew. Um, if loads of people are jumping on it and you want that content, just reply because the content creator is probably checking those replies to give permission or not give permission. Um, so that will be seen quicker than you kind of messaging them elsewhere, uh, which is what we did. Um, and then, yeah, if you're kind of getting in touch with people, always be mindful of their situation. Like it is very easy to be insensitive or have tunnel vision and just see it as a piece of content. But somebody is in that situation and they have taken that. So, you know, check if they're OK. Never ask them to take risks on your behalf. Um, and it is shocking the amount of poor form there can be when it comes to kind of getting UGC and putting requests, especially in terror attacks in those situations like oh could you just get another shot of that no <laughs> no they need to be safe you're doing your job they are in a bad situation just always double check it um be human about it but hey Tash I hope you're okay and safe uh could you could we possibly use this video 
um, if you can take it to a private channel. Um, Chris here, who's the video editor at Metro, um, he's just done a very like, I'm sorry, you experience this, like it would be great and give a kind of a reason behind why they want to use it to like highlight what you're you're trying to put across. Um, it just adds another element to it of you as a person, not just a kind of Twitter robot, journo bot. Um, you also need to remember then again, practically ask them explicitly, did they take this video, when they took it, where they took it, is it definitely theirs? Oh no, well, my, my friend sent it in a WhatsApp group and he, well, he didn't take it, but his mate did, but I think he did. I don't know, that's not their video. You don't want that. You want to find the source and then that's how you can use it. Um, and then when you've got something, take screenshots of that permission given uh, because inevitably if you've got that for free, and then suddenly they're being offered money by somebody else. They might come back to you and want money from you. Uh, and you can go, you, you gave permission when we asked for it. That's kind of, and that was before you maybe signed a contract with somebody else. We've got this, it's time stamped. It's ours, it's ours. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so that's it for news gathering. Uh, just a quick one on, on safety. Um, and then I'll be done and can answer a couple more questions. Um, so with safety, uh, Twitter circles um, is another feature that's similar to kind of Instagram's close friends um, and it means you're now able to tweet to a select group of followers and um, you can pick these followers a lot of my friends have done it and it's just their friends that are journalists or people that follow them and they'll just tweet things out it's if they want to tweet that picture of them down the pub um, they can do it that way um, if you just need to like vent <laughs> you can do it to those that those close friends that circle and do it that way um again it's just like another layer of protection as well if you only want to share your article with a few people or what you're kind of thinking um it's not going to be the best way to provoke your journalism but it could be a healthier way going forward if you are a prolific twitter user to kind of filter down where those tweets are going um and also it could be a good way to discuss things with other journalists if you're not in a community with them as well uh, that's on if you go to your profile uh, you can go to twitter circles and you, and you can create that there um you can also limit your replies uh this is actually i'm so happy when they introduced this because this has been a long time coming um it just means you can limit your replies in like three different ways so if you tweet something you can make it so everyone can reply people you follow can reply or only people you mention um, it does mean the tweet still appears in the main feed, but people then won't be able to engage with it, won't be able to kind of interact with it if you don't want them to. Um, and there is also now a downvote function on replies to tweets. Um, this is uh, basically a way to signal to Twitter that something is offensive. It's just a really quick way to do that. So you don't have to go through kind of the reporting um, or that it's irrelevant as well. And it's kind of, it's not, I don't really, we as a whole don't really know how it massively works at the moment or the impact of it, maybe because it's still quite new, um, but it does seem like it's a, a quick way to be like, we don't like this, don't like this. Um, and it's not, it's not as it was feared, a thing to be like, we hate this tweet because it doesn't come on main tweets, it only goes on replies. Um, and then here's the promised Harry Potter content. Um, so trolls, they still exist, they're still out there. Um, it's just kind of how you deal with them is how they kind of progress. Um, and I would say always try and speak to your editor, your lecturer, um, anyone you kind of work with about this if you are targeted, because there are ways to kind of work around it and work with Twitter to limit this. Um, ultimately, you can just, just step away, just turn off your phone, just get away from them. Um, but yeah, ultimately ignore them if you can. Uh, trolls want that negative reaction. Um, flag it to an editor or colleague or Twitter if serious. They can be quite responsive around these. Obviously, there's still there's still failings there. Um, if you do respond, um, and it's maybe not like an ambitious troll that is just got a whole network and all they do is troll people every day and they're just doing something for reaction. If it is someone who's just a dick to you, um, a lot of the time people don't expect a reply. 
and it will just be like Dave from Sussex having a moan going actually I think you'll find this is wrong um and you can if that's something that you reported on and you know it's fact you can go Dave actually respond calmly and with facts and say actually I think you'll find it is and when it's somebody who has some reason there a lot of the time they're shocked that you even responded to them uh and they will just go oh oh sorry sorry I didn't realize that you were actually gonna talk to me um so they'll just leave it and then that's it kind of sorted um but then also you can use tools within the platform you can report abuse you can block people you can mute people muting is very good for people that are quite annoying and you still want to follow them and still need to follow them um but you can just mute them from your feed um and that's kind of a good thing to do um and yeah as mentioned you can look at lists and see if that's kind of impacting you in any way I won't play that again. Um, so yeah, that's basically it for Twitter for journalists. In terms of posting top tips, uh, consistency and volume is good. Use the tools at your disposal, uh, repurpose stuff from other platforms, articles you've written, articles your colleagues have written, um, and engage with your audience um, if you can reply to people um, and start conversations within communities, closed communities, or in public as well. And that's it and go and follow the iPaper on Twitter and me if you want. Thank you. Of course we want to, Tash. Thank you so much, um, Tash. So much uh, amazing tips and advice. In fact, Sarah's just posted, Tash is very generous with tips and insights and experience. Thank you. Um, so yes, Tash, that's, that's been amazing. Um, let's just mop up any final questions. Um, Fiona had one um, online a little bit earlier on, Tash, which was, is there a limit to how many um, Twitter accounts you can have? Um, I don't know. I would say probably um, just to avoid kind of content farms and them having loads of different like bot accounts. Um, it's also a lot of management and I wouldn't recommend having more than two, um, as it's often kind of hard to kind of keep those like going and alongside each other, unless you have like a bigger content management platform for your social accounts. Um, so I would say yes, but that's probably something stupid, like a thousand. Um, but I would say maybe try and keep smaller the better um and keep them focused and producing as much kind of good quality content um as you can okay thank you tash um people asks uh, do you have any specific tips when it comes to mental health and our use of twitter i mean I'm, i know you've you've touched on that but anything else you would suggest that we do just to um take take care of ourselves um personally i don't have it i don't have it on my like the front screen on my phone i have it in a social folder that's like two swipes away <laughs> um so it's not just there to just tap and then doom scroll through uh don't doom scroll i would say um i now largely see it as a kind of work tool um so i don't re i do go on it outside of work um but not as much as i used to um and just kind of i would set up like digital well-being uh, things on your phone you know where you can have timers and it's like you've spent eight hours on twitter today um having your phone tell you that is terrifying but also very effective um so i would say use those take a break from it um like as much as you can uh and yeah i think i think it's that shift in seeing it as a thing to use all the time um and then confining it to kind of office hours if you if that's kind of that benefits you then definitely do that Okay, thank you, Tash. Any other questions here in, in, in the room? Yes. Um, I just wanted to go back to the university user-generated content um, about um, like the best way to kind of get in touch because obviously it differs depending on whether it's like your average Twitter user or if it's like a bigger company. Is there like, a, 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 like what's the big difference that you should be mindful of when you're um, reaching out for different kind of like demographics for 
your like getting content and things and requesting to make sure yeah no that's a great question tash uh, did you did you get that so um yeah so depending on who who the 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 person with the twitter account is when asking for that ugc i think kind of use your own judgment and just have a check of their profile like as i mentioned there's people that will just come to twitter to complain and don't use it on a day-to-day -day basis or know how it can be used um so like morally don't take advantage of that if like susan's just had a really terrible holiday and she's online to have a go at tui um but she's not used twitter in 10 years and and she's like yeah i'll talk to you about it um and doesn't realize that all her tweets are public and it could be seen by her boss on monday like it's just take a judgment of everyone you get in touch with um also just if it's like a company just know you're a reflection of the newsroom you work for um uh, and you might get a no um take it off platform as well um supply your whenever you're getting in touch with people supply your work email uh, and see if they'll get in touch with you that way um and yeah i think just kind of use your own judgment in approaching different people um if they've literally not tweeted anything for ages or only do the occasional retweet they're probably not as savvy um as other people would be um so i think just kind of there there probably isn't a stock reply to everyone um and i think there is uh I can't, i'm really sorry i can't remember who's done it but if you look for um ugc sourcing online um a comp i think it might be Roy thompson reuters did a, a kind of a guide to it and the best way to approach people in kind of like distressing situations um but it also applies to kind of people that are not really used to using social media um but that that, that does exist out there and it is it is helpful thank you any other questions yes uh, i think i'll go also a bit back uh when it comes to engagement with your profile on twitter do you think it's better to cover like a bigger, more trending events that are going all around the world or somewhere locally uh, for engagement? Or if it's better to just engage with other journalists daily and just kind of every day or every few days frequently? Like which one is better for audiences and gathering following or just someone to uh, read your stories and articles? Yeah. Um, I have a very annoying answer to that, which is it's kind of a bit of everything. Um, <laughs> there is no like one quick fix. Uh, I would say kind of build if you're building a focused following on a specific topic, go local, go specific to that topic or area and build that out. But if you're kind of jumping on a hashtag or a trend, it could be that your tweet is featured alongside side. Um, Barack Obama's about World Alzheimer's Day. You just don't know. Um, so I would just do like a healthy kind of mix of like consistency, but also trying out different things. Um, like I I don't go viral every time I tweet because I also don't want to, but you just you just sometimes you nail it. Sometimes you could do a tweet that's got that somebody else has done that's got 24,000 likes and it's just not worked. Um, so just I'd say just try. A variety of things, um, depending on kind of what you want out of it. Yeah, 